Israel unleashes bombings on Iranian nuclear sites. Palestinian terrorists murder civilians in front of a synagogue on Holocaust Memorial Day. Russia unleashes three new super-advanced nuclear game changers. The Davos summit releases global warnings that some appear to mirror Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. An anointed evangelist issues warnings to the church concerning certain false prophets. Transhumanism is growing exponentially. Join us for these stories and much more on Headlines Meets Prophecy, January Explosions 2023. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark. You're watching and or listening to the Russick Outlook. As always, thank you very much for joining. Today's topic, Modern Headlines Meets Bible Prophecy, January 2023. I've subtitled this January Explosions. Why? Because there's just been an enormous amount of activity, not only physical in nature, but also spiritual, things that are developing and exploding, if you will, within the church, uh, within culture. So that that and and I so I wanted to cover a, a lot of this because I really as a matter of fact, I'm coming to you a little bit late, and this is early February, because things were happening right up till the very end of January in Israel in particular, where I, I just felt like I needed to capture all of that uh, in order to kind of paint a, a, an accurate presentation for the month of January. Uh, so if, before I begin, please hit the like and or subscribe button, uh, as well as ring the bell, whatever platform you're watching or listening on. We really appreciate it. Subscribe to the channels. It, it really helps us rise in the rankings of the algorithms. And last, I would just ask, if you wouldn't mind, please go to the RussickOutlook.com and sign up for our email list. We notify you of new events. There's new things that are happening. We're doing uh, Zoom presentations with live audience so that we can learn from each other and share information with one another. So, I, I, you know, I, I, I've covered a lot of this in the past, so I want to get into it. There's so much to unpack, so much to cover. So let's let's do that. So January explosions. Let's let's see what we have here. Uh, and, and you see all of these, in, if you're following me on video, I've got a, a whole bunch of different uh, pictures depicting, uh, you know, what the topic is. And these are all things that, that happened in January. But we're going to be breaking down so much more. But I want to start, as I always do, I always like to begin in what's happening in Israel, because Israel is always the focal point, um, not only within the country itself, but the other nations' relationship with Israel, uh, because that is that is the heart of the Bible. And when you look at Bible prophecy, you, you first and foremost look at Israel. So before I do, I'm going to paint, and as I said earlier, um, up until the very end of January, there's been staggering uh, um, developments. So I'm going to read for you and uh, present a little bit of a timeline from January 26th to January 30th, all of the different things that were taking place uh, um, uh, centered on Israel. So uh, in, in the West Bank, Israeli forces conducted a military operation, this is on the 26th, that left more than a dozen Palestinians dead. Dozens more were injured. The goal of the operation was to ca capture a Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror cell. Those who were killed were armed terrorists who fired upon the Israeli security forces. So this was a, uh, this was a military operation. Uh, the Palestinian leadership holds the Israeli occupation government fully responsible for this dangerous escalation uh, and, and basically accused them of, of, of war crimes there. So on that same night, the militant group Palestinian Islamic Jihad and others fired rockets towards Israel uh, to the, in, in response to the raid. Uh, Israel then launched more rockets towards them. So this is an, an escalation that happened. Uh, down to the next day, on the 27th, Palestinian gu uh, gunmen opened fire in East Jerusalem, ki killing seven Israeli citizens. Uh, and, and it was right outside of a synagogue. Uh, this was the most lethal attack since 2008. Uh, it also attack came on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Go to the next day, the 28th. A nighttime drone damaged key weapon productions in Ishtafan, Iran, a, a hub for the country's mi uh, military, I'm sorry, missile industrial complexes. Uh, is Israel, I'm sorry, Iran immediately blamed Israel. Um, 
I think most of the consensus is this was orchestrated by Israel with uh, the approval from perhaps the Americans. Um, but but nonetheless, this was pretty significant because they've been bombing and going after different posts, particularly in Syria. Uh, but this is an attack directly in in, um, uh, in in Iran and in a couple of different locations within Iran, uh, pretty much damaging their uh, nuclear ambitions or their infrastructure, if you will. And I'm going to show you a picture that I was able to capture of this uh, in a second. So then fast forward to the 30th, uh, the American delegation led by Secretary of State Anthony Blinken heads in trying to calm things down because, you know, within a matter of days, you've got this escalation happening on uh, between Gaza, Hamas and, and the Israelis. And then, you know, a day later, two days later, they're bombing Iran. So, you know, that easily, you know, can escalate like a, a, a match in a forest fire. So he went in to try to calm things down. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's difficult because they're coming at it, they being the Americans w wanting the two-state solution, wanting to have um, the Palestinians with a capital in East Jerusalem. And, you know, so there's just, there's a, there's a clash of policies. Um, and so he met with uh, um, the, the Fatah, I'm sorry, in, 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 the West, in the West Bank. I don't know. He didn't go into any meetings in, um, in uh, Gaza or um, with Hamas naturally uh, being a terrorist organization. But so I want to, in this next set of pictures, and I want to kind of summarize a couple of things that, are, that happened um, within, the, within this. Point to on the map that I have here the different locations that they hit in Iran, different nuclear facilities, and then um, show you just how pinpoint specific some of this was. So if you're following me on podcast, I'll describe this to you. If you get a chance, if you go over to the Russic Outlook, Rumble, YouTube, you'll see the videos there. So let me cut to this. Um, to, so let's just summarize the events. Major drone attacks uh, important military facilities of the of the Revolutionary Guard in uh, Isfahan. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this right. Azhar, Rasht, Karj, and Mahabad. Uh, fingers are pointed at Israel. Uh, some American claim uh, forces claim that the U.S. Uh, and another country that isn't Israel said, um, and, and other country that isn't Israel. The Wall Street Journal claim that Israel was behind it. In addition, a convoy of 24 cargo trucks was attacked from the air at the border crossing between Iraq and Syria in what appears to be an Israeli military strike. Six refrigerated truck, uh, trucks were destroyed. So on the right-hand side, I show you images that were taken from one of the facilities and uh, just how, how pinpoint it is. So it, it looks like I have these red circles over the roof of the building that it attacked. It's basically the, it's, it, the, the size of a refrigerator. That's how pinpoint it was within this very large complex of a building. So this shows the extent to which the Mossad went to destroy crucial components of a future Iranian bomb is astounding. They needed to gather intelligence with very high resolution so that the drone could position itself correctly and make a small hole in the roof. Then after the hole, they accurately hit and destroy a uh, critical component within that facility. So, uh, you know, I don't know how tall or how long this complex is, but it's it appears to be, uh, I'm going to say, potentially a couple of hundred yards maybe. And... Um, just figure with that roof, imagine a, a hole the size of a refrigerator was uh, preset and then they were able to go down uh, um, extensively into whatever area was below that, 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 that cut out there. Um, now, fast forward to what else is happening. And this is why I say, you know, keeping on the theme of explosions, uh, this is a political explosion. Uh, the Times of Israel captures the heart of the matter. Netanyahu truly aims to be King Bibi. This is the uh, this is the publicity, or this is the uh, prejudice of of, uh, 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 of the press. Uh, we must now use all legal means to thwart him. Deaf to all warnings, convinced his and state's interests are identical. Flanked by criminals, extremists, and theocrats, 
He is hell-bent on attaining near unlimited power. Now, I just want to pause here because this is my opinion only. I see an enormous amount of parallels between how the media and the powers that be and the uh, people who pull the purse strings went after 45 in America, and it appears to be that same type of playbook that they are going after Netanyahu. They want him out. They don't want him in there. Um, and you've got some very um, similar uh, ways of trying to bring him down and, and, and tangle him up in all kinds of court matters and legal matters, uh, a, a lot of pretty substantial accusations. But nonetheless, he's been able to withstand a lot of this, and you know so much so that this is his sixth term in office, and not that 45 you know, had only the one term and he's looking for a second, but uh, he was able to withstand a lot of the the nonsense that went on. And, you know, they dragged things on for years in the courts and, um, you know, everything turned out to be a lie. Um, Whether you like him or not, you know, that's, that's up to you. But from a Christian, I will say this, that his policies were more in line with biblical principles than any other president in American history, bar none. Um, but but at any rate, uh, for a number of other reasons, they don't want him in, uh, you know, in addition to that. So I, I, I point here something. Let me, let me cut back to the video for a second. Uh, yep, there we go. Every time a right-wing government wins an election these days, the immediate refrain from the dominant global media is that it's a threat to democracy. So I, I, I don't know if you're really aware or, you know, if you're paying attention, every time in the past year, particularly in America, no matter what happens, it's a threat to democracy. It's a threat to democracy. But the even more alarming factor, you can hear the parrots from one network to another network to another network to a news organization to an online paper. They're all saying the same thing. You know, they might change a couple of words here or there, but the 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 mimicking of the message is is, is uncanny. And but you see this in other nations too. Um, for instance, the slogan "Build Back Better." You know, that was in the World Economic Forum. That was ca- Canadian. That was Trudeau. You know, th- all of those policies come from other locations. And when I see they're destroying democracy, I've seen that um, wh- where they went after uh, the uh, now um, uh, past president of Brazil, the, the current uh, president or leader of, of Italy, um, I think they went after uh, the, the same in similar fashion in, in Bolivia, uh, Hungary. So it's always, oh, they're, they're taking down democracy. So Israel's new government by Prime Minister Netanyahu is getting this treatment now, and the brawl over the country's Supreme Court illustrates why this issue is more complicated than ever. This is another thing. It's another explosion that we're going to cover on the legal system if you're following what's been happening in our country, in America, for the past six to eight weeks and all the legal implications for 45 and 46, um, you know, there, there's similar parallels what's happening over here. And, you know, it, it's, you know, now been come out in, uh, in terms of uh, the um, uh, le- legal a- agencies um, of, of the United States or been in cahoots with a lot of the online publications and, and social media, uh, basically using them against, you know, American people. So um, you see a lot of this happening in Israel. You see a lot of this happening in the United States. So that's why I said, you know, the, there's explosive natures there. Um, then shift gears just for a second, focusing on Israel, but ha- as it pertains to um, uh, Russia, Ukraine, the Pentagon is moving more and more military weapons out to Ukraine. They're now pulling from stockpiles from Israel. So um, military gear that was designated, you know, as uh, inventory, if you will, for Israel as well as Japan uh, is now being pushed and moved over to um, uh, to those countries And uh, at the same time, we now received that Israel has requested to buy 25 advanced F-15 EX jets from the United States. So um, just a lot developing from the uh, Israeli military. 
getting back to the judicial reforms, what this really comes down to is there's an enormous amount of power in the judicial courts in Israel, uh, much more power powerful than they are, say, for America, which would be my natural comparison. Um, you have unelected judges who are able to basically dictate what the politicians do or who can serve, who cannot. Uh, so, for instance, there was a, a, a political uh, appointee from Netanyahu that had to be removed from office, uh, according to the judges there. They, they removed him. And Netanyahu and his offices are fought, fighting this and fighting the system that this is unfair. So now you've got, literally, you had over 100,000 people in Tel Aviv on the streets protesting Netanyahu. Uh, and, and protesting what they say is is, is basically a, a a capture by the politicians to rule the courts in Israel. So, uh, you know, it's 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 a very similar fight. It's in, in in a sense of if you have judicial control, boy, you 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 come at it with an enormous amount of power and influence. And again, we see this in the United States. I'm going to shift gears for a second and focus on some interesting developments concerning um, the Abraham Accords and some maybe uh, additional benefits that are coming out from it uh, in, in other nations. Um, actually, aside from the um, uh, Abraham Accords, I'll show you a picture of the first uh, Ukrainian birthright group that came, uh, first group that came since the invasion in, uh, in uh, the Ukraine by the by the Russians. So there's a picture of them. Uh, tourism in Bahrain is, is skyrocketing. Uh, it surged to 10 million visitors in 2022. They now have the Formula Grand One Prix will drive even more growth. And again, Bahrain is one of the four Arab nations that signed uh, the Abraham Accords are in full concert with the uh, Israeli government for tourism, for exchange of business ideas, um, entrepreneurial aspects, agricultural developments, which we're going to get into in a second uh, concerning the Negev Desert. Uh, Sudan, the office of the ruler of Sudan, in an official announcement, uh, General Buran met with Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen and discussed with him ways to establish fruitful relations between the countries on security and the military. Uh, the North African nation of Chad, Prime Minister Netanyahu met with the president of Chad and said that Israel highly values its, its relationship. And this I found very interesting. The UAE on the upper right uh they decided to have Holocaust education in the state schools. Now, naturally, they met with uh, a lot of blowback. But I would say, you know, I applaud them for having the ability and really the spine to come against some of the Islamic pushback, if you will. And uh, so, you know, they're, they're now educated because for many, many, many years, most of the Arab world would teach that the Holocaust did not happen. It was fabricated. It's it's just, it's not true. And um, so now, you know, it, these these are some of the fruitful benefits that we're seeking. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to highlight it. Uh, I, I saw some interesting developments coming out about Israel's Negev desert uh, and, and, and how they're looking to it towards the future. Just to give you a little bit of a backdrop, uh, um, David Ben-Gurion, who led the um, Israelis into establishing the state in 1948, uh, retired a couple of years later, and uh, he's a, he was a farmer. And he started farming the Negev Desert. And he said something to the effect of, I forget how much, maybe it's 20% of Israel, if not more. And he said, you know, if we're going to succeed, we have to be able to uh, farm this desert. And, you know, whoever thought of that, but yet it's blooming, it's blossoming, just as, as the Lord described and or prophesied. Isaiah 35, 1 says, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. So I want to show you something here on video. Um, and, and I just kind of mentioned that this all starts with Abraham. Uh, the Negev desert takes out oh, two thirds of Israel's landmarks. I'm sorry. Uh, but 10% of the population lives there. 
Abraham lived in Beersheba, which today is the largest city in the northern Negev with a population of more than 200,000. Um, this is where, and it goes on to where uh, the, that, that this was uh, not allowed into the, I'm sorry, with Moses, pardon me, uh, where Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land, but the wandering of the Israelites in this desert um, brought them from the Sinai through the Negev to where they sent out the 12 spies, which is mentioned in Numbers, where only Joshua and Caleb, you know, reported that they could uh, defeat them which basically sealed the deal for Israel for the next close to 40 years. But this is where God shows his power and might. This is where he dropped manna from heaven and so forth and so on. But what I wanted to point out here is, uh, let's see, um, in the third paragraph on the right, there are a number of large solar fields in the desert that are now being built. Desolation of uh, desalinization of seawater is already taking place, enabling Israel to expand its water to its neighboring Jordan. Israeli experts are visiting Dubai to share their know-how. Ben-Gurion University students from developing uh, African nations are learning how to develop food and water security in their homelands. So think about this. Um, you know, where they're able to share the, the wonders of what they've been able to produce in the desert. And, and I'm talking about that we're the largest exporter of, of flowers. Uh, I've mentioned before in a, a prior broadcast, the Italians love the tomatoes so much that they import them from the Negev into Sicily. Uh, and you know how much the Italians love, love their tomatoes. So, you know, these are just some of the things. And so the, the, agricultural developments, the watering systems, the desalinization of the seawater into drinking water. Uh, there, there's just so much that's going on that's helping other African nations now, uh, um, uh, other Arab nations. So their expertise that God has blessed them with, they're now blessing others who want to engage in peaceful uh, relations with with the Israelis. So I, you know, I, I just applaud them for doing this, and I I, I marvel at, at God's blessing and, and grace, uh, and and gift on on the Israelis. Um, and it's just I just wanted to highlight this that this is just another. It's a fulfillment of prophecy of, of what Isaiah laid out. It's just it's a testimony to the goodness of God, but also to the determination of the Hebrews to carry out the work that God ha has put on them. I'm going to switch gears now to Davos. There was, um, uh, in, in January, as it is in every January, the World Economic Forum and other leaders gather from around the world. Hopefully by now you're very familiar with this. It's interesting because now the people in Davos and, and others are kind of shying away from not wanting the publicity because more and more people over the last couple of years have become hip to what these people are doing and what they're really after. And, you know, it's it's coming out it now, you know, as much as some of the uh, media would try to side with them or help them, um, the overwhelming consensus of your everyday um, your everyday John and Mary or Jim and Mary, uh, um, you know, are, 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 are wise to what's going on there. So, they call this, in, in their meeting here in January, a global polycrisis. It occurs when crises on multiple global systems become casually entangled in ways that significantly degrade humanity's prospects. Uh, introducing crises produce um, harms greater than the sum of the crises would produce in isolation. Obviously, more crises, more problems. Um, that's and and it's really it's a long-winded way of, of saying the world is going through many simultaneous problems or crises. All are connected in some way, and like a chain of dominoes, pieces just keep falling into different directions. As the individual crises interacts with each other, the total harm is far worse than if it were happening in isolation. It's notable that the public uh, uh, purpose of the World Economic Forum is to solve pressing world problems through globalization and the use of the term polycrisis shows that these problems are increasing in numbers. Um, so much so that they are no longer dealing with one or two. Now it's going to rapidly increasing uh, crises. So I wanted to point out what Jesus said, that these are the beginning of sorrows and birth pangs. And some of the things that they highlight as the as to the reason that they need to uh, intercede, 
they've identified oh maybe 10 or 12 different uh, major crises that are happening from their perspective. So they say the world's major challenges, this is what came out of the uh, Davos group. They said right now, according to the latest, here's the problems. The pandemic is still ongoing, especially in China. The war in Ukraine shows no sign of ending. Inflation is still raging all over the world. Democracy is under attack or decline. Climate change is causing extreme weather events. Fears of worldwide recession are ongoing. Gun violence is soaring in the United States. Much of Africa is experiencing drought and famine. World food production is spiraling downward and prices are skyrocketing. Artificial intelligence has entered the mainstream. I also highlighted in yellow things that you could tie to what the Bible had laid out. The war in Ukraine, I believe, is a precursor to what inevitably will start to develop as far as Ezekiel 38. It's certainly not right now, um, but I think the stage is being set, especially with, with Russia there. Um, you know, inflation, you know, you can point to so much of this and uh, what we will see in Revelation, uh, democracy under attack or, or on the decline. I, I mentioned how there, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> it's horrible sneezing on camera. Um, <laughs> sorry. Live TV. It's not live, but it is being recorded. Um Climate change is not, uh, but, you know, they are saying that that's, that's going to be one of their major focal points in how they control the economy and how they control a lot of your habits in the future will be through climate change. Uh, the fears of a worldwide recession, you know, uh, drought, famine, you know, we're seeing a lot of that in, in Africa, but you're seeing that in other parts of the world as well. Food production spiraling down will, will cause even more famine. So these are all birth pains as far as what was laid out um, uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, when he spoke to his disciples and others uh, about signs that would be coming, marking towards uh, his, his return. So I want to also, on that note, kind of shift gears a little bit towards what the world is seeing as we are starting to see all these signs building up that were laid out in the Bible that are indicators that the time of Jesus' return is soon. I always say, I don't know when soon is, but the more these things are happening, uh, you know, the closer it is. So, and as a matter of fact, I will say real quick, uh, my next presentation will be absolute definitive proof on we are living in the last days. And by the last days, meaning the, the, the soon imminent return of Jesus Christ. And according to what we can look up and we can verify that has happened in the last 50, 60, 70 years, historically, uh, um, and as well as all of the headlines, I can guarantee you we are living in these last days. So there's something called the doomsday clock, and I've actually notated this a couple times. But in January, they changed the time where... Um, they say, uh, this is a group of uh, scientists that will say the closer we get to midnight, the more danger the world is in. So it had gone back as far as 17 minutes at one point. It started in late 40s by Einstein and others, especially when the nuclear bomb came on. It was supposed to be a warning to the world. Um, I believe when communism fell, uh, that was the, the furthest back it went to 17 minutes. And then for the last couple of years, over the years, it's just gone up and up and closer. So the last couple of years, it was 100 seconds. They moved it up another 10 seconds. It's now, what do we say? It's 90 seconds to midnight. So, and they, interestingly enough, they will tell you midnight means Armageddon. Uh, that's exactly what they call it, which is, you know, kind of ironic if you think about the Bible. But I also think about how Jesus points to the midnight hour and the parable of the 10 versions. Um, and that's, you know, either you're going to be received or you're not. Um, so I, I, I just find that interesting. But I, I did want to point out, because, again, there was some interesting parallels to the Bible. So January 24th is when it, the clock changed. Um, and some of these things I've talked to you about. Um, so why they moved it up. These are the reasons they moved it up. India surpasses China in population, and they have 160 nuclear warheads. An unstable North Korea. 
Iran's nuclear enrichment and capacity uh, is is growing. So I'm highlighting some of the ones that you can fall in line with the Bible as well. Russia, Ukraine, and I pointed out why uh, earlier. Cyber-enabled disinformation, controlling the narrative, the propaganda, lies, fake news, threat to democracy. Uh, they also cite climate crisis as a reason. The escalating tensions between the United States and China is another reason. Uh, they also point to biological threats and pandemics. You know, Jesus said that uh, there will be uh, plagues. And uh, the lack of leadership, I've pointed this out. And the reason this is important is because eventually, um, the before the Antichrist arises on the scene, we're, the, the world is going to be in such turmoil on so many different fronts that they're going to look to a leader. And if you search the world today, there are very, very, very few true leaders uh, of, of, of the world or areas of the world, regions of the world, um, who, who have the moral compass and the spine to, um, to get at things. And, 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 and even if they do, they're, they're being pulled back by others. Uh, they also said that they're, the years leading up to 2030, which is also interesting because of the UN and, and the 2030 agenda, climate and bioplagues, most important in human history, uh, will, will be hitting that point by 2030. So as Christians, we recognize the events that are coming on around us, and a lot of this is tied to the Bible, not all of it. Uh, but also the world is. So even if you don't know the Lord, the world has a sense that Ooh, something's not right, something's out of kilter, and these nuclear scientists are kind of pointing to it. So I'm going to shift gears to a second to Russia. The Russian warship armed with advanced... This is another part of that whole January explosions theme that I was highlighting. Uh, so the Russian warship armed with advanced hypersonic missiles completed a drill in the Atlantic Ocean ahead of joint naval exercises with the Chinese and the South African navies scheduled for the middle of February. The uh, middle of, I'm sorry, middle of January. The Russian Defense Ministry said uh, the Admiral of the Fleet of the Soviet Union, Gosh, Gorshkov, will conduct a training combat launch of a hypersonic missile, Zircon, during the above international exercises. This was announced on February 3rd. So it is the middle of February. I apologize. They announced it in January. Um, then at the same time, uh, senators want to block the, the sale of F-16s. Uh, uh, because Turkey is blocking the NATO expansion. So because of everything that's developing in Russia and Ukraine, you now have Finland and Sweden wanting to get into NATO. A lot of the uh, nations want to welcome uh, them in, thinking it, sh it strengthens, the West, strengthens the Western alliance. Uh, so here you have senators saying, uh, look, if, if Turkey is really a friend of NATO and it's a member of NATO, then... Uh, and if they're adhering to this stance, then we don't want to sell them. So they're they're trying to leverage their uh, or leverage the purse strings that they have some influence over concerning the president's ability to uh, um, to complete deals. So Russia has s new super weapons, and and this is part of what I I, I really wanted to kind of focus on, because th this is a very big developments here. And again, if you think of Russia and Ezekiel 38, several years ago, President Vladimir Putin announced Russia was pursuing six supercharged weapons that would massively enhance Russia's nuclear capacity, serving as nuclear game changers. In recent days, these uh, advanced weapons have garnered a great deal of coverage, and three of them are now on the scene. Uh, you have the Zircon hypersonic missiles, which I just mentioned, Sarmat ICBMs, and Poseidon Doomsday Torpedo. So the Zircon, they travel so fast that they are impossible to detect and intercept. They can fly five times the speed of sound and are highly maneuverable. So not only are you defying the speed of sound, but uh, you can, you know, you, you can navigate. Uh, these, whistle, these missiles work by faster <clears throat> by being faster than the weapons used to shoot at them. So, you know, no matter how you're going to try to combat them, they can, they can evade and they can um, outrun you, if you will. Uh, 
They are capable of traveling 7,000 miles per hour with a range of 600 miles. So imagine something coming at you that fast and can hit you 600 miles away. Uh, the Sormat ICBM, designed to carry up to 15 nuclear warheads, five more than the outgoing Soviet-era uh, R-36M named Satan. The missile is li liquid-fueled and categorized as a super-heavy ICBM, uh, one with enough lifting capacity to deliver a multitude of warheads. Uh, then your third one is the Pors uh, Poseidon Torpedo. It is an intercontinental nuclear-powered uh nuclear-armed autonomous torpedo uh, as a nuclear-armed underwater unmanned vehicle. Put more simply, it's a giant nuclear torpedo. So it's nuclear arms uh, un underwater in, in submarines. So where is this all going? Uh, you can't predict it, but here's here's some things that we do know. Uh, they their, their pursuit of these weapons highlights the fear of the U.S. and fear of the West. So you know, part of their motivation of doing this is to combat the West. So as you see these developments happening in Russia and Ukraine, and now with NATO so heavily involved in Western Europe, you know, that that whole lining up of nations, just as Daniel had laid out, you're going to have the two legs of Daniel, which is going to be one is the East and one is the West. Um, so it's it's really, it's taking shape. So Russia is strengthening itself. And, you know, there are times where people will point to they're not, and they're clearly not doing the way that they wanted to in Ukraine, but um, they've got a lot going on, on a, a, as things develop. So, um, you know, as this is all playing out, there's still an, an incredible amount of nuclear development uh, that, that's going on. Russia will employ one or more of these weapons in the Ukraine. That is the concern. What happens if they start using them? What happens if they're in the Black Sea and, you know, and, and, and they unleash this? And, and that's part of the motivation for Russia. They want the, the control of the Black Sea. They want the seaports. Uh, they look more and more desperate all the time. And if you start to embarrass Putin, you know, what he's capable of unleashing, you know, we, we just don't know. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's not, a, nobody wins. Nobody wins in this situation. I'll put it that way. Um, and, you know, concerning the, the, concerning the potential of, I believe, based upon descriptions in the Bible, that there will be nuclear, uh, n nuclear arms in, in, engaged in battle and in war. And I found that Luke 21, 25 through 26 says this, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive what is coming in the world for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And that potentially is, you know, describing what could be happening, uh, you know, with, with, with nuclear engagement. Um, the last thing is the growing military ties between Russia and Iran raise the concern that Russia could transfer super weapons to rogue states like Iran or maybe even North Korea. Um, you know, you even have, I think it's over a thousand nuclear scientists are now working in Iran. Um, then there's something called the death ray. And I, I was going to put it on video and then I decided not to. So it, you can look this up you know, online, there, there are some videos of it. You'll see groups of s Russian soldiers, and they believe that there's nothing significant in terms of their positioning. They might even been trying to, to leave the area. But you see them in the video, and then all of a sudden, boom, and they're gone. I mean, it just happens that quickly. And it's something that people are saying that this is technology that the Ukrainians now have called the death ray. And uh, it's, you know, you see stuff like this on in movies and, you know, the, I mean, instantaneously, you know, they, they're following it. They can follow now from the drones. Boom, it hits. There's just a crater left in the earth, fire, smoke. But the people are, you know, all the soldiers were gone. Switch gears again, New York City, um, talking about spiritual bombs, spiritual, what's happening in the culture. So there was a pagan uh, horn statue that has been delivered to a New York City courthouse, and it pays homage to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her defense of abortion. Uh, so I'm going to show you this on video. You can look this up if you know, the podcast listeners. Uh, it's called Now, which sits on top of the courthouse alongside other statues representing lawmakers throughout history. 
The statue itself appears as the body of a woman emerging from a lotus, which is often associated with the pagan Egyptian god Nefertirim, as well as the Hindu gods Vishnu and Brahma. It also features Ginsburg's well-recognized lace collar, a nod to the late justice, according to the artist, which sits below the figure's braided horns, which the artist herself affirmed are in fact horns. So, you know, I, I, I have no doubt that some people will brush this off, but if you have followed the news in the United States and the absolute venom that came out about the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the response by so many in this country where politicians and governors were even putting out billboards and saying, come to my state, we'll pay for your abortion, we'll take care of you. Uh, the sex change operations will provide, will take care of you, no cost to you. I mean, it's just been an onslaught uh, of evil. Um, and and uh, it's to me, this just is a further indication of how far off the guardrails we've gone. And I point out something that there's a... Um, a messianic rabbi named Jonathan Kahn. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with him. I happen to be just totally floored by some of the research that he's done. I've read a number of his books, from The Harbinger to The Oracle. I don't think The Oracle's gotten a lot of notoriety, but I'm telling you, that's just... Anyway, he came out with a book, I think in December, called The Return of the Gods, and he points to uh, how the proliferation of a lot of what we are seeing in the culture and a lot of the degrading uh, and the embrace of, of evil, you can point to what he says is the return of gods that were around thousands and thousands of years ago, you know, spiritual entities that were given a great, great deal of power um, uh, before the birth of Christ. And, you know, you can date back even um, shortly after uh, um before the flood, but after Adam, you know, the Nephilim and, and the just the pervasiveness of evil throughout the earth. So, you know, when I saw this, that's the first thing I thought of. And I, I've just, I've started to get through some of the book. Um, it's, you know, it's just tremendous. But, and he points, and he points to abortion. He points to the embrace of abortion. There's some things in there in his book uh, that, that just defy any type of, uh, happenstance or just circumstance that it just happens by chance and by certain dates and things. Um, so, you know, again, embracing evil, welcoming evil um, is just, you know, to me, another sign. Uh, then there's something, and I'm starting to wrap this down, but I want to focus now on the church and culture. Uh, there's been some interesting developments. There's something called chat GBT that GPT, uh, which stands for Genetor generative per chained transformer, pre-trained transformer. I'm sorry. I'll get my tongues right. Um, but at any rate, this is an AI chatbot. It's a program It came on. It's got over 100 million subscribers, faster than anything else, faster than Instagram, faster than TikTok or anything like that. Um, one of the leading investors of it is Microsoft, which I found interesting. And rivals like Google are looking to incorporate something similar into their search engines. So I think of Microsoft and Bing and their search engine. And naturally, you think of Microsoft, you think of Bill Gates. Uh, but what this can do is you, it, it's, uh, it has the ability where I could, for instance, I could say, um, write, write me a short story. Write me a romantic short story, and it will be able to do that. And then um, you can then take that and say, well, I need a little bit more edginess or mystery to it. And it will twist the story, and it will it, it will start to massage it that way. And they say, well, you know what? Um, I, I want it in the style of a certain author or maybe a certain speaker. And again, it, it will do it. So, and from what I understand, I haven't, I haven't done a number of people I know they said it's uncanny, you know, how, how good the quality of the writing is. But it goes much further than that because this is uh, artificial intelligence and the, uh, um, the amount of, I don't want to say, well, let, 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 let's just say the amount of computing power behind it is astounding. Uh, and, and the amount of information that they uh, that avails to it, if you think of almost a search engine, and that this chatbot could potentially have something like it, uh, so it can it can pass a bar, it can pass a medical license exam, um, it can pass a 
uh, a doctorate's exam. So for test purposes, you can potentially see, uh, you know, maybe college students using this to write an essay or, you know, uh, to write, you know, you know, whatever they need to do to, to attain the grades of, of whatever academia profession it has that. But the other interesting development is it's bias. And by that, I mean this. So if I said, tell me something good about a policy that came out of the 45th and 45, it would say something to the effect of, no, that's politically incorrect and we can't do that. And then tell me something that came out of the policies or good attributes of 46. It will go on and start to list them. Um, tell me the benefits of feminism. It will go on and list them. Tell me the benefits of uh, a, a masculine or a masculine dominated uh, society. I'm sorry, there is nothing there, nothing redeemable. I'm paraphrasing, but you get the idea. Tell me the benefits of colonialism. No, I'm sorry, that can only produce racism. It can only, you know, do that. Or tell me the benefits of Black Lives Matter, and it will go on to pontificate about that. But tell me the tell me the negative attributes about that, or tell me the uh, um, contributions of certain races or whatever. And so it tailors it. So it's not. So to me, I look at this as it's got a value proposition that is embedded in the program. So rather than create reality, it's shaping reality. Uh, so it starts off with a, a bias and it, it presents itself. So if you think about this over the long haul, now this is what we're noticing now, but again, if you look at what the left and the progressives are trying to do in terms of rewriting history, tearing down the statues, this happened, that happened, that never happened, this, it, you know, eventually over time, and you see this in different empires and civilizations. You can see this in the Middle East. I talked about earlier how the Holocaust never happened. That shapes how a child will learn. If a child is taught four, five, six, seven years old, the Holocaust never happened. By the time they're 12, 15, 18, guess what? The Holocaust never happened. And that's what this is doing. It's it's dictating to you and is telling you that with some type of authority that this is the way it is. So to me, that's that's very, very dangerous. And I would say this, that the more and more that you see AI and the more you see uh, artificial intelligence and the embrace of, uh, of, of technology, should be as no surprise, but to me, the gospel is at the center of it. Why do I say that? We're moving more and more towards an embrace and, and cross-pollinization of machine and human. Uh, I pointed out in the last one or two episodes about what I call human 2.0. Um, there are very influential scientists saying that uh, humans will be hybrids by 2030. Um, uh, Yuval Harari of the World Economic Forum says uh, humans can can be hacked now. Uh, so the the embrace of technology or chips in, in you know in, in under the skin. Uh, potentially on your forehead, they they basically, that technology is now becoming part of you. And in the long run, you know, once that the uh, tribulation comes on board, that will be, you know, this, this sign. You have to take the sign of the beast or you cannot trade, sell, buy, or potentially travel. So you, and once you take that and you embrace that code, you're changing potentially your DNA. And I think that's really the end game because it's really about the DNA of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that transforms us, pun intended. So this is what I would say is the gospel is at the center of this. And this is the end game of the enemy. We are transitioning into what is an assumed post-human paradise. So I wanted to point out two scriptures. They say pretty much the same thing, but from the Old and the New Testament. Psalm 8, 4, verses 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visits him? For thou hast, hast made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. So mankind is made, is special. It says that the angels in another scripture are envious of, of, of what, what the Lord has done here. Thou made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, that thou hast put all things under his feet. 
Hebrews 2, 6 through 8. But one in, in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visit him? Thou made him a little lower than the angels, crowned him with glory and honor, did, did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all subjection under him. He left nothing that is uh, not put under him, but now we see that all things are put under him. There's another translation in the Greek uh, of Hebrews that intimates, I forget what the word is, that they are, we are made a little lower than the angels for a short time. Um, and that potentially could mean that with the resurrected bodies and once we're, we, we, you know, we're in heaven and, and, and I can't say this definitively, I'm just I'm, I'm saying what one of the Greek translations points to. But if you think about it, we are going to be, and we have the potential now to be made in the image of what Adam was, what Adam was originally created before the fall. And that, and we're so precious in the sight of Jesus that Jesus left heaven and came onto earth and gave his body, he gave the, the pure blood of Jesus to redeem us. So if Satan can change that body chemistry from the DNA of Jesus in you to the DNA of Satan, um, and and by putting some of these technology potential, I'll say this potentially, uh, this is not happening. Well, I, you know what? I, I won't even say it's not happening now, but it's, it, I'll just say that technology has the capability to alter your DNA. There is things called gene editing that can happen um, and down the road, there's a good chance that it could once we are dealing with the tribulation, uh, those seven years. Uh, just wanted to point out two things. Again, staying with culture. I was a little disappointed, and I didn't see as big a response. I'm going to point out two movies now. Um, one just aired near the end of January on a weekend in, in the theaters called Left Behind. Uh, Kevin Sorbo, Neil McDonald, Corbin Berenson, Sarah Fisher, Greg Perot. Um, from what I understand, uh, that there's been an enormous budget, you know, put into it. Well done. Uh, everybody who I know uh, who have seen it had rave reviews. And um, but I, I, I'm, I'm highlighting this, and I'm, I'm highlighting the chosen because here you have the gospel being preached and shown in theaters, in the arts, not only in film, but, you know, I'm talking about other areas. And this is where I personally feel that the church uh, misses it in terms of got getting behind certain aspects like this and, and supporting the, these endeavors. These are massively financially expensive endeavors to, to take on. Um, you certainly have to have a great deal of faith. I've heard, you know, as far as Left Behind is concerned, I know the first movie that came out was horrible in terms of its quality. But the books by uh, um, Tim LaHaye and, um, and Jerry Jenkins were just incredible. I mean, I, I, I think I read them twice, plus the audio book. Uh, just, just, you know, really, really, really well done. And I think there's close to 70 million in books that were sold. So, I mean, it tells you how much. But, but, but I guess, you know, here you have a situation where you can celebrate the gospel and you can have people go to the theater and, and get behind something like this. I saw very little uh, bought out by this. And, and also for The Chosen, and I've seen some attacks on The Chosen in terms of, you know, it's not exactly the word and there's been some artistic licensing. And guess what? You know what? There's gaps that we don't know about or, you know, how much do we really learn before the, the three years of the ministry of Jesus? Not that you should deviate from the word itself. Um, I personally, I've watched The Chosen. I love it. I think it's awesome. Um, I'm blessed by it. And uh, I've, I've also heard the arguments against it. And sometimes it's, you know, if you were to say you're transitioning the word, you're changing the word, I would get behind you. Um, but there's nothing there that I, I find in terms of looking at it from the word perspective. Nothing compromises the word. Um, the, they've made some artistic interpretations of what may happen or how certain miracles may have taken place in a certain location, in a certain atmosphere, maybe some of the dialogue that went on. But I don't know. Um, I just, 
you know, I, I think the church has missed it in that regard. So this happened in January. Then there's something else that's that's happening in January. The news came out in January. So uh, there's commercials out there now called He Gets Us. And I don't know a lot about it, but my understanding is it's it's reaching out to people of all different uh, backgrounds, whether you're a skeptical, agnostic, a, a, um, an atheist, trying to entice you to think or maybe see Jesus through a different paradigm of what maybe some preconceived notions are, um, which, you know, I, I applaud. Um, I think there may be some things that it could be thought of as being a little seeker-friendly, um, but they are putting millions of dollars. And the reason I wanted to point this out, and I'm going to bring to the video as I wind this down, I promise, um, they're going to take on two Super Bowl ads uh, next week, uh, in five or six days from where I sit here now. Um, so he gets us ad campaign for Jesus shells out for the Super Bowl time with the help of anonymous donors. And they don't, these donors don't want to be, uh, notate or they don't want to be, um, made aware of. They, they're not doing this for their fame. They're doing it for the glory of Jesus. And, you know, if, if you're doing something like this and so big and your, and your motive is pure, then, then that's awesome. And they have, uh, networked with, I think thousands of churches around the United States, but possibly elsewhere in the world, where they're pointing people who are reaching out to them, people wanting to learn more about Jesus, and they're networking them with different churches within the structure of this organization. So God bless them. I, you know, I applaud them for that. And what, and at the same time, again, I'm not endorsing it because I see something on there and I pointed it on the slide in the video. I'll go back to it where one of those things says Jesus was fed up with politics too. That's a pretty strong statement. And I, 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 <laughs> I'm going to, I, I don't know that I've really ever seen that in scripture. I, Jesus certainly fought with the politicians of his day and calling Herod a fox. And, uh, you know, there's, if you look up some, if you look up the history of, it's called the Herodian dynasty, because if you look at the gospels, Herod is mentioned on a number of different times and occasions it's because there was different king herods and uh there's another minister in canada and there's a friend of mine kathy bixel who did some work research called the political spirit and it kind of gets into the herodian dynasty um, but when i see something like that then i think oh you know i think that is a little seeker friendly um potentially and again i don't know enough about it but what i do know is they're embracing jesus they're supporting the gospel uh, they're trying to get people to get out, to, to get to churches, to maybe, again, look at Jesus from a different paradigm, a different perspective. And I applaud them. And, I, you know, uh, so I, I, I wanted to point that out. And the other thing that I think is interesting, I, I showed you, I'm going to cut back to the slide again. Three other ministers, Greg Laurie, Franklin Graham, and Di Dr. Michael Youssef, who I have seen over the past couple of months, advertise nothing else but salvation, meaning a 30-second or 60-second advertisement or maybe something online, sharing Jesus, encouraging you to give your heart to Jesus. If you do, I know Greg Laurie will send you a Bible free of charge. There, there, there's no ulterior motive there. They're trying to help you. And when people in ministries like this are shelling out that kind of money with just the motivation of, of seeing souls turned over for the gospel— Man, we, we, we need to applaud them. We need to embrace them. We need to pray for them. We need to say, hey, how, what can I do maybe if you're in a position uh, to maybe partner with some of these ministries? I'm not telling you to, but um, just kind of make an awareness of the more that evil is coming against us, the more good and the more the church I see is fighting back. Uh, or sections of the church. So I, I just wanted to point that out. And last, there was something very interesting a gentleman named Mario Morello, who's a uh, evangelist, comes from California initially. Uh, I think he's in. They've settled in Tennessee now. Um, I, I just I love Mario. I've been familiar with his works for well over twenty five years, and um, he is as solid as can come. Um, and and his heart is evangelism. And he's gotten a lot of uh, notoriety the last couple of years. He's been writing these blogs. 
and they're very quick. And I would encourage you, Mar Mario Murillo, uh, to look up his blog, subscribe to them. They're generally less than five minute reads. Um, and somebody, I, we were talking to friends the other night about this, what I'm going to mention. And they talked about how not only is he just, he, he's an economist of words. Like he is, he, he has this way of packing words in economically, but getting to the heart of the matter. Um, but he's been at odds with many in the gospel, many in the body of Christ. And I wanted to point this out because he's, he's calling out false prophets. And he's doing so based upon what he sees and what he believes the Lord is telling him to do, but also how this lines up with Scripture. So I wanted to point this out because I, I find this very compelling. Second Peter 2, 2 confirms the danger of their slander, uh, meaning the false prophets. But they were also false prophets in Israel, just as there were many false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of the truth will be slandered. He goes on to say, but they are also doing double damage. They deceive people in the, ki in the kingdom, keeping them from the true revival while preventing souls from entering the kingdom. They are guilty of the charge just that Jesus leveled at the Pharisees. For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in many people's faces. You won't go in yourselves and you won't let others uh, enter either. Matthew 23, 13. They are more dangerous than you realize. Let me, let me just cut. And he said this, Matthew Henry said, one traitor inside the church is worse than a thousand persecutors outside of the church. Many modern preachers do not agree. They think preachers like me are overreacting that we should leave it in God's hands. He will take care of it. But Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may not charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Paul told Timothy, I urged you. He said it so forcefully because correcting the, the false doctrine is one of sacred duty. Oh, how we need to get back to the Bible. And he you know, closes this portion which he says, You should not accuse me of making these fake ministers look bad. You should be horrified that they are making the gospel look bad. So the two ministers, if you go online, that he's, he's calling out, and I think he's calling potentially others, but he's he's highlighting two. He's not naming them by name, but he describes them in a way it's pretty obvious and you know who they are. Um, but that's happening in the body. And so here's a leader in the body at this time in this hour. And because you have so much online presentations and there's good information and there's bad information and there's good teaching and there's bad teaching and there's righteous teaching and there's false teaching. And he's calling it out. And, uh, you know, I... I, I think it should be applauded. And I'm just going to close real quickly. I'm going to tell you this one Mario Murillo story that uh, just it, it meant something to me in terms of my um, how I feel about him. 25 years ago, 95 or 96, uh, I was a technical director of a very large church. And it was so large that we had to have our Easter service in another facility because we had probably four or 5,000 people. And we would have it in the Raritan Center in New Jersey. Anyway, um, he's coming in from California. We're in New Jersey. And he gets there and he says privately backstage, we're kind of micing him up or whatever. Um, and he even said it when he came out. He said, the Lord's given me a word for this church body. It's only going to take me, I think he said 16, 17 minutes, something, 16, 18 minutes, somewhere in there. And me and my, I, I, I'm jaded and I'm sitting at the console, I'm mixing and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way he's coming from California, five, four, 5,000 people, and he's going to preach a 15 minute, 16 minute message. Not going to happen. He gets to 16, 17 minutes, whatever it is, closes the book. And he says, that's what God gave me for you, for this body. And without saying anything else, hundreds of people started getting up tears, people bawling, wailing, coming to the altar, repenting, or asking Jesus into their hearts. Salvations came, miracles came. 
And the, that's all he did. He preached the message. He closed the book. He said, that's what the Lord gave me. And no altar call, nothing. The people just moved by themselves. And I'm sitting there, I'm bawling. I'm, you know, saying, you know, I'm, 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 I'm finding, you know, admitting, I got, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. But that was, that's the type of character that, that I was left with the impression with, from him. So long-winded way of saying that I, I, I have a high regard for him, for his ministries and his books. Uh, so, all right, enough of me. I need to close this out. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, please email me at russicoutlook at gmail.com, as well as prayer requests. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you've been listening to the Russick Outlook. My name is Mark, and remember, as always, just my opinion.